Praise the Lord, brethren. Today, God wants to help us to understand who is Jesus. And as simple as this question is, that many of us will want to say, No, <laughs> I know Jesus. Ah, uh -uh. I've been taught Jesus. I know so much about Jesus. Why will not be questioning your knowledge of Jesus? But there's an aspect of Jesus that we want you to understand today because it's going to form the foundation of the understanding of why you are giving your life to Jesus. We've been explaining for a few times now the meaning of giving your life to Jesus. And while it may look like a very simple statement, oh, to give my life to Jesus Christ, oh, it's not a big problem. Oh, I know what it means. I need you to understand again. The Jesus you are giving your life to, who is he? Exactly what does he represent? I will start from the point that many of us believe that Jesus came for a perfection of things. Many of us believe that Jesus came after many things have been done and things were not working well. God now decided that let me send Jesus. Some of us even believe that according to the writings of Brother Isaiah, Prophet Isaiah, that the Bible says, Who shall I send? And Jesus said, Send me. So many of us believe that he has sent prophets. God has sent this person, sent that person, and they did not do the job well, or it was not perfect the way God wanted it. So finally, God now said, Oh, since we have sent Moses, we have sent Abraham, we have sent this. Things is not working on earth as it should work. Who shall I now send? Jesus now said, oh, send me. Go and kill me. That's what some of us believe. But we have to go back to the beginning to understand and have a clear understanding on the coming of Jesus. This will help you to understand the Jesus you are giving your life to. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. I will depend on your understanding of the beginning of Genesis. And I will just talk about it. Then we will go to Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, the, the, the world was wonderful. Then he created man, Adam, and put him in a garden called Garden of Eden. And God cultivated the garden for Adam. And Adam was lonely. And God caused all animals to pass in front of him. And he named them. And whatever name he called them, God concur. Because in the first place, Adam does not have a will apart from God. He submitted to God's will and God's instruction. And was following heaven, heaven ways then. Then, uh, there was a tree in the garden that God said nobody should touch and eat out of. And uh, Adam got a wife. And they were together. And at a certain time, serpent came. Being used of the devil. To tempt them and deceive them to eat of the food they've been told not to eat inside. They ate and they sinned. And sin came into the world. In Genesis chapter 1, the last verse, God looked down from heaven and said, Wow, the earth I created is good. Everything was good. In Genesis chapter 2, the last verse, God looked down from heaven. The marriage he created was wonderful. The marriage was working well. Both husband and wife were naked and they were not ashamed. So in the first Genesis chapter 1, the earth, everything was good. Genesis chapter 2, man has been created physically and he has a relationship with his wife. God looked down from heaven again. The earth he created, the man and his wife and the institution called marriage, everything was good. But by Genesis chapter 3, sin has entered. Things have gotten spoiled. Man has lost his relationship with God. Man will be chased out of the Garden of Eden. By the end of Genesis chapter 3, what has happened? God has chased man away from the Garden of Eden. Man has lost his connection with God. So while God was speaking to the people that was involved, serpent, the man, and the woman, and not just serpent, the snake that we saw, but the spirit that used the serpent, which is Satan himself, 
So God was speaking to the three people involved in the situation. Serpent, the man, and his wife. And God spoke to serpent. You have done this evil. You have come to earth. You have destroyed the relationship between man and his God. The earth that was good before you have destroyed it. Man that was good before you have destroyed him. The woman that was good before you have destroyed her. In Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, I looked down. They all look good and perfect. But now sin has come into the world. There is only one solution. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel. God is now saying, I will put enmity between you and the seed of the woman. Between your seed, which is the seed of sin that you have planted, and the seed of the woman. Please note, when a woman gives birth, we don't naturally call it our seed. Why? Because a man impregnated her. It was a man that put a seed into the woman and the woman adds her own to it and it germinates so if you want to go biologically it is actually the seed of the man and the woman because this one put a sperm this one put a egg and they form a baby so the bible jesus did not say or god here did not speak and say it was the seed of the man who would have been waiting for a prophet that will be born but God gave a solution. A sin has entered the world. Sin is now here. Sin is now come to destroy the beauty, the goodness, and the wonderful things that God has done here. Sin has entered into the world. I want you to know it was not the day that uh, they sinned that Satan entered the world. Satan has been there. Before he entered the serpent to do this evil, Satan has been there. It's been available. So it was not Satan that entered the world that day. It was sin. Man disobeyed God and man lost his relationship with God. By the end of Genesis chapter 3, God has chased man out of the Garden of Eden. Man was no longer living there. So how will God now reconcile man? God has stated right here in Genesis chapter 3 that I will send the seed of the woman and looking the all through the Bible, we discover there is only one person that was a seed of a woman. Because no man impregnated his mother. And that was Jesus. So in Genesis chapter 3, God has already promised that I'm going to send Jesus. He's going to be the seed of the woman. He's the only one that has the power and the authority to bruise the head of the serpent. And all the serpent will be able to do is bruise his heel. Please note, when a serpent only bruise your heel, it means that he was not able to even deposit his poison inside of you. He was only able to bruise the heel. But when the head is bruised, <laughs> when the head is bruised, the serpent is dead. When you bruise my heel, I will still keep walking. I'm still going to be alive. That's why Satan came to Jesus and tried to kill him. And what happened? Jesus resurrected. All you did was bruise his heel. You could not kill him. He could not remain dead forever. But Jesus will now have the authority to bruise the head of the serpent. So Jesus was not an afterthought. Right from the beginning, before any other human being came, God has designed that the only solution to what Satan has brought was Jesus. That's why you will discover, if you check Genesis chapter 4, Adam and his wife started giving back to children. And immediately they started giving back to children. They started doing sacrifices. Cain and Abel had to come with a sacrifice. Something that was not happening before. Because they were not even the owner of the food in the garden. It belongs to God. 
Everything they were living inside belongs to God. They need not bring a sacrifice out of what belongs to God to God because God owes everything. But when God chased them out of his, his will, chased them out of his presence, they now have to be coming back looking for God via sacrifices. And this sacrifice was what everybody was doing. Abraham was doing it. Isaac was doing it. Jacob was doing it. All through we got to the land of Israel. When the children of Israel now formalized it. And Moses now came and put it down in a law. So this is how we are going to formalize it. This is how we are going to do it. All they were doing was finding a certain way. A way of getting to God. I remember a recent where we were working in the house. The plumber was doing something. And in his process of doing it, the tap broke. And now that tap is connected directly to the tank. There was no control to switch off the tank so that water would not be wasting. And there was no extra tap around for the plumber to use to correct it. So what did he do? He went to look for a stick. He put nylons at the top of the stick and blocked the tap. Of course, water was no longer gushing. But was that the perfect solution? No. Is that the final solution of the plumber? No. Is he going to leave it like that? No. That was just a temporary solution. While he went to the market to go and buy a correct tap, the final tap, that is the final solution to the problem of the broken tap. So finally he came with the final solution. What did he do? He removed the old one and put the new one. But when he came to remove the old one, did he come and say, this old one is useless? Oh, this old one. Hey, he did not. He was the one that plucked it temporarily. When it was time, he removed the old one and put the correct one. That's exactly what happened with Jesus. Jesus came because he's the final answer that God has promised in Genesis chapter 3. God has already promised that, okay, Satan, I see your work. You have come to the serpent. You have deceived man. Man has sinned against me. No problem. I have just one solution. Just one solution. There is a seed of the woman that will come and bruise your head. So for about 4,000 years, in the biblical counting that people did, I didn't do it. Somebody did it and told us it was 4,000 years. Between the Adam and Eve saga, and when Jesus was born, what do we have? Temporary solutions. Temporary. Take an animal. Kill it. It was temporary. Uh, do this uh, and do that. It was temporary. Everything written there were temporary measures. So all the prophets of the old, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Isaiah, what were they working in? Temporary solution. Because Jesus, that was promised, has not come. So all they did was temporary. Temporary. But that Paul, God bless his soul, he said it was a shadow. All they were doing were just shadows. <laughs> because they've lost the real thing. In the garden of Eden, man lost the real thing. Man was left with shadow. So man was working with shadow. Elijah with the fire. All he was working with was with shadow. It was all temporary, waiting for the manifestation of Jesus. That's why Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. Jesus finally came in his day. And came finally to become the solution to what happened in the Garden of Eden. So when we say you should give your life to Jesus, we have not said give your life. To any other person. We have not said give your life to any other process. We have not said give your life to just anything. We are asking you to give your life to the solution that God has promised. Right from the foundation of the earth. 
right in the garden of Eden. When things went wrong, God has just one solution. There is just one solution to sin. There is just one solution to break away from God. There is just one solution to bring man together back to God. There is just one reconciliation from God. And that was Jesus. That's why when Jesus came, he came with his own set of teachings. All the way we've been doing it before, we thought it was right. It was just shadows. Before, when, when, we, when, when somebody is eyeing a lady, we say he has not committed adultery. When he's removing a skirt in his head, we say he has not committed adultery. Even if we cut them, they are still removing their clothes. They have not slept together. We say, well, you, you only cut me almost. I have not committed adultery. The only time we say they committed adultery was when we cast them on top of one another. But when the master came, the original came, he said, no. <laughs> no. That's not how it works. You guys, you've been using shadow, so you don't understand how it works. Now, let me tell you how it works. You just think and you have committed it. Praise the Lord. So Jesus is the original. Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the only one that God promised the seed of the woman is going to come. And he's the only person in the Bible. He's the only person in the Bible that was born without, excuse me, without the addition of a spam from a man. It was the Holy Spirit that overshadowed Mary in the book of Luke chapter 1. The Bible says that in the Gabriel said, and the Holy, Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And that which will be born of you will be called of God. Finally, the seed of the woman came and bruised the head of serpent on the cross. And all serpent Satan was able to do was bruise his heel. And that is your victory. That's the access to your victory. So when we say you should give your life to Jesus, we are not saying that uh, Jesus that came, it was just another prophet. We are not saying that Jesus that came was just a solution to all the errors that all the prophets have been making. We are not saying that Jesus just came because all the people have failed. And God said, oh God, I'm tired. All these men have failed me. Who will now go? Jesus that said, yeah man, yeah man, I will now go. No. <laughs> no. Right from the very beginning, it has been promised. That Jesus was coming. Now, finally, to now put icing on the cake. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, The beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, word. What are you listening to now? Word. Can you see the word? No. How is the word coming to you via my voice? If I don't have a voice, I cannot have a word that you will hear. Though we may have to have it written. And you see, say that's your word. But the easiest form of a word comes from a voice. When you hear a voice, you know you are hearing God. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord. God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Let's read from King James Version. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Voice is our words. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So tell me, who was walking? In the garden. The voice. The word. The word that we were told again in the beginning. In John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So who is that word? It's Jesus. So who communicated with Adam and Eve. In the garden. It was Jesus. So what did Jesus tell Adam and Eve in the garden? God told them. Jesus told them, I have seen the problem that has happened. I'm a witness to this error. I 
am coming back this time around as a seed in the woman to defeat the devil. <laughs> so when we say you should give your life to Jesus Christ, we are asking you to give it to the solution, the only solution. Go through the Bible. If you read all the prophets, all you read there, they are shadows. Those are not the permanent solution. There is only one permanent solution to see. There is only one permanent solution. There is only one way. There is only one truth. There is only one life. There is only one person that you will follow him and you will not be in the shadow, but you will be in the light. Because he himself is the light. In the book of John chapter 1, the Bible says that the light shines in darkness and the darkness cannot comprehend it. It did not say that the light was shining and there were shadows. <laughs> Why the old were battling with shadows? Jesus came and he was the light. The light so much shined that there was no shadow. Darkness disappeared. So when we say you should give your life to Jesus, we're asking you to give your life to the light. Surrender to the light. In him, there is no variableness. There is no shadow. There is no confusion. Him and him alone. So brethren, this is just to introduce to you who exactly Jesus is. Why Jesus came. It wasn't because errors has happened and Jesus was confused. Oh, Moses did not say everything I wanted to say. Ah, David was just dancing everywhere. He did not say the things I wanted him to say. Oh, okay. Civilization has not come very well. They don't understand. Okay, let me now come. That was not why Jesus came. Jesus was not an afterthought. Right from the beginning, they know the end. So Jesus was in Genesis. Then Jesus came physically. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the next time we see him again is in Revelation, when he's coming back. So he was in the beginning, he's in the middle, and he's coming at the end. So brethren, when we ask you to give your life to Jesus Christ, we ask to give it to the past, the present, and the future. We have asked you to give your life to the only solution available to man. Can I call you now to come and give your life to Jesus? Now that you have known who Jesus is, now that you understand what Jesus came to do, now you understand the process, can you now stop running etta scatter, but focus on Jesus? The Bible says Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Our faith started in Jesus and our faith ends in Jesus. Can you focus now on Jesus alone and give your life to Jesus? Can you make up your mind now not to be running confusion everywhere, but to focus only on the only solution that was promised to man, Jesus. God bless you as you give your life to Jesus.